So thank you so much for attending today. This is fantastic. And it's, um, you can see we've got, um, with the exception of the Liberal Democrat, we've got all five candidates for Southampton itching. And with the exception of Jack Davies, uh, he's subbing for Liz Jarvis, who was unable to attend today because she lives in London and was unable to get time off of work. Jack is the PPC, the prospective parliamentary candidate for uh, New Forest West. West, is that New correct? Forest West, yeah. For New Forest West. So uh, he's just stepping in on her behalf. So I know a lot of your questions, the questions that we've had which are on the agenda are very much itching based. Uh, this is about the university and that we have one on um, policing as you probably saw. But um, Jack will be able to speak more broadly because we will broaden it out. We'll be speaking more about national uh, issues as we, as we go through today. Given that the tone of political debate in this country currently is not very nice, it's often, there's not a lot of courtesy for reasons which I think are probably well known to most people in this room. So if I could just ask you, um, you know, when questioning to be polite and respectful, even if you don't agree with the response, and the same thing to the candidates, of course, uh, you know, we don't want to end up in a, some kind of brawl. Um, light jeering is, I think is fine if, you, if, you know, if you're not too happy with the response, but I wouldn't want it to break out into any kind of hostility, as it were. And also just, I think this is one other thing as well, is that um, all five candidates are, are here wanting to serve the public, and that's to serve um, you as a representative for this constituency. So that's a pretty tough job, and I don't think these days being a member of Parliament is quite as glamorous as one might think. So under those circumstances, uh, I think it's an appreciation for their commitment to the public good. Only two-thirds of teenagers and two-thirds of students are registered to vote. And then half of those registered to vote do not actually vote. So in stark contrast with the, with the pensioners, 94% are registered to vote and they nearly all vote. So this, I think the only way we're going to get student and um, youth and young people's agendas onto the political agenda is that your vote's got to be worth something. And I'm not saying that anybody on this panel um, looks at you and thinks, well, I don't need to have a conversation with silent students because there isn't anything in it for me. So I think the reason why your agendas are not on the top of um, the government agenda, um, you've only got to look at tuition fees and various things, uh, is because you don't have a big enough um, say in the agenda. So you should exercise your right to vote. Southampton Itchin is a, quite an unusual constituency because it is the sixth most marginal constituency seat in the entire country. So the current MP, which is Royston Smith, his majority is very tiny, um, 31 votes in 2017 out of 43,000, no, 46,000 votes cast, I think. Um, so this really is an opportunity for um, Solent students who live in the Itching constituency um, to chat, well, to challenge, but to communicate very strongly your views to the candidates today and say, if you want my vote, then I want you to do this for me. So this is a good start. I think this is the beginning of something. I wanted to um, let the candidates um, step up and give a very brief presentation three or four minutes about who they are and um, what their aspirations are for Southampton um, itching. Um, Jack will have to do that by proxy but the other four can speak very uh, in, in, a, in a very detailed way about their aspirations for the um, city. Um, so to that end if this is okay I think I'll start with Simon and 
come this way. So, Simon, over to you. Thank so, you. Simon, let's... Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm the Labour candidate in the election. I was the Labour candidate last time, and uh, me and Royston had a very uh, well, interesting evening where there were three recounts, and there was 31 between us. I think both of us will never forget that evening. <laughs> Um, I previously said that I've been, I've been lived in the city for all my adult life. I came here in 1981 to the other university. And I've been a councillor for 18 years and I was leader for five years. And also I've been a teacher in local schools for, for over 20 years. And it's interesting enough, in, in my day job, 80% of the population trust me. When I sit here, only 20% of the population trust me and yet I'm the same person. So I have a little bit of disparity there. In terms of, of the way that... that I can demonstrate trust in the past is when I was leader of the council I made it absolutely clear that everything we wrote down on a piece of paper, every, every uh, pledge we made I would record and we had them and they're still there displayed uh, at the civic centre saying these are the things we said we'd try and do and when we did them we ticked them off so people could publicly see that we stuck to the commitments that we made and so that was a, a physical representation to build the trust which I know is lacking in the political world. So what am I, what am I, why am I the Labour candidate and what, what am I campaigning on? Well, I, I'm the Labour candidate probably because I was the one that lost by 31 last time and everybody in the Labour Party felt a bit sorry for me and said, oh, you can have another go. <laughs> but the, the, what I'm com campaigning on is a genuine wish to invest in this city, in its people, in the services that they rely on and in our infrastructure. And I think the best way to do that is, is to vote Labour at this election uh, to get that package of investment that we so desperately need in social and environmental issues. So I'll start with health. Now, it's an acknowledged, and I know that Royce has acknowledged it in his, in his literature, that there is an issue in, with primary health care in this city. It's quite difficult in parts of the east of Southampton to get a, a doctor's appointment, and we need to do something about that. We need to invest in our health service, and I would say that the key investment, like in, in most public services, is in the people that actually run the service. So it's in the doctors and the, and the nurses and the healthcare professionals that are available to do that work. Now, my partner's a physiotherapist, so I do get it in the ear quite a lot about the pressure that the health service is under. And the only way to relieve that pressure is not only to train more people, but also to ensure uh, that we retain the quality staff we've got. And people don't leave, and they don't leave the NHS due to stress. I would also like to talk about education, which is obviously deeply ingrained in the person I am. I mean, I've been a teacher for over 20 years, and I think I'm the, one of the things I'm proudest of as, as, as city council leader is keeping all of our sure start centres open. All the evidence tells us that investing in young people at the very start of their lives, zero to five, is the way that we actually ensure that they are they have run successful lives. They're successful in school and they have successful adult lives. So I'm very proud of that. I also think that we need to have further investment into our schools. The school system in the city is creaking. There are some schools that are running a massive deficit. It was they had 10 million pounds of surplus five years ago. Now they're they're in negative territory. The system can't carry on with the resources it's currently got. And of course, uh, universities, the Labour Party's got a well-known pledge about uh, uh, tuition fees. I know parties have made that pledge in the past and subsequently signed it away as soon as they got into coalition with another party and suffered the consequences. So I don't think we'll be making that mistake if we're in government. Uh, the other main issue for me is housing, that we have a desperate need for low-cost uh, well-built housing and the Labour government is pledged to, to start a ha council house building programme, the largest since the, se the, uh, the Second War. And of course that will bring uh, jobs and opportunities and, and safe family spaces for people to bring up their families in, in secure and reasonable cost. And we also need to do something about the private sector, uh, private rented sector. Uh, there are many good landlords in the city but there are also some shocking ones. And we need to basically invest in enforcing the laws we currently have and then bringing in a code to ensure that private rented tenants are protected. And of course, the, everybody who steps out on the streets of Southampton in the centre will see the issue with homelessness. That's the tip of a homelessness crisis in this country. We need to, to be investing in the services that not only support the people that are actually on the streets, but also the people uh, that are near to that, are sofa surfing. So we need investment in mental health services and in uh, addiction uh, uh, services to support people on it with addiction problems and we need to, to look very carefully at the benefit system and see what is forcing people out of largely private rented accommodation into no accommodation whatsoever 
And finally, I would end with climate change, which for me is a far, far bigger issue uh, than Brexit uh, for, this, for, for us as, an, as, a, as a, a world. We are at risk as a species in, in signing our own death note unless we do something about this. You know, the decline in the natural world in this country is massive. You know, 97% of turtle doves are, are gone. Hedgehogs are virtually disappearing. And that is in the UK. We need to take severe action on climate change. So it, that's about reducing uh, carbon input in our homes, insulation, solar panels, ground uh, source heat pumps. It's about um, investing in our infrastructure. We need flood defences in the city, I would argue, for investment also in tidal power. Uh, and we also need, of course, uh, to plant that magic device uh, which sucks out carbon, uh, the tree. And I think Southampton, which has got a great record of, of, of creating green open spaces, can do more on that. And uh, I would suggest that climate change is, is the massive issue that possibly uh, will define the next 10, 20, 30 years in politics and how we collectively respond to that challenge. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with a, a, a quick summary. So basically my issues are health, education, housing and climate change. And that is what I am campaigning to change in this city at this election. Thank you. Okay. Hi, awesome. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm the Green Party candidate for um, Southampton Itchen. Um, my background is not politics. In fact, this is my first hustings that I've ever attended. <laughs> so, um, so I'm a little bit nervous, but it's okay. At the um, deep end. <laughs> the, nothing wrong with the deep end. No. Um, interestingly, I normally come to Solent University each year when your media studies uh, students are actually doing their demonstrations here. And uh, I've got a few of them in the organisation I work for who are, who are really great. But, um, but the context I'm here today is very much from the Green Party perspective. Um, bit about myself. I'm the first member of my family to have attended university. My parents are immigrants. They came to the UK in 1966. Uh, they both worked for the NHS for their whole lives and uh, my, my father particularly worked in, uh, in mental health. Um, I got to a stage in things where I think I, I went through my life trusting politicians in, in many ways, as far as you can trust them, looking at how things would allegedly improve, looking at what the promises that, that were made to us by the governments that we elected. And frankly, I got to a point in time where I became very disenfranchised with it. I have a young family. I've got a son who's 14 years old, so he's just a little bit behind you guys. I've got a daughter who's five years old, and I'm sitting there, you know, worried to death about what the future's going to look like for them, both from a climate emergency perspective, from a potential for what the future's going to look like for, for jobs and services around them that are going to support them in their lifetimes. Um, so that's part of the reason, actually, why I'm doing what I do and standing for the Green Party. I've been a supporter of the Green Party for pretty much the last 25 years, although from this context, this is somewhat new. Um, the, the big issues on the table, obviously, you, you guys are no doubt well aware of the climate emergency that's on our hands. Um, we are, we're seeing a lot of activity. The, the things that have been going on this summer with the protests have been great. They've been raising awareness. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, the Green Party's agenda with regards to things like climate change has always been there. This has always been part of the use of, of ethos of the Green Party. It's great to hear other, other parties, you know, talking about their, their potential green agendas now. I hope and pray in many ways that it's not just uh, empty words to win an election. I can tell you for a fact the Green Party certainly is not. Um, I think that we're, we're, you know, the Green Party is aiming to, to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2030. If you're interested in reading manifestos, it's out there on the website. Um, we have an actual plan. It's a well thought out plan. There's people in our party who have been working through these aspects, looking at the, rea the reality of how we actually do this. It's not empty words. It's a, it's a real plan, a real action plan on how we can actually make a difference and improve both our localities and, and our overall country. In many ways, what we're trying to do is set ourselves in, in many ways to be a thought leader for, for the rest of the world in some cases, because um, there's many people now that look at in despair at what's going with the climate emergency. Individuals are saying, well, what can I do? How can I change it? And in many ways, the change comes from home. But as much as individuals, as much as we try to do things, I think a lot of it has to come out of local government, out of central government, to start setting the way, to start putting the message out and educating people on what they can change both individually, on a larger, on a larger basis within organisations and corporations, and then actually working with other parts of the world, working with Europe. As you're probably aware, the Green Party is pro-Remain. And we think that's a, an important part of it as well if you're trying to develop policies and find ways to deal with, with such things. Um, the kind of things that you know, really do concern me, air pollution is, is a big one. Southampton obviously suffers from 
bad air pollution, as you, you guys are probably aware, exacerbated by the things like the airport expansion that's going on. Now, it's an interesting one. As I say, I'm from the, uh, representing Southampton this year, and I have two of my colleagues at the back, Catherine and Ron. Ron is a candidate for Eastleigh and Catherine for Southampton Test, but we sit under the umbrella of Southampton and District, which is great because when you look at things like the airport expansion, it straddles multiple constituencies. So we really are a team. Our views are very much aligned, and we look at ways that we can help improve things across the wider area. It's Southampton itching, yes, but it's kind of broader than that as well. Um, on top of that, there's um, there's our aspects for how we, I say we can deal with those things. We're, we're very keen to look at the NHS issues. It's been brought to its knees um, in recent years under under you know the governments that are, that are currently in place, and uh, we would like to see you know more investment in that area and training in that area to bring the NHS back to the level of capability that is required in order to service the general public. Um, public transport is another big issue for us as well. Um, Southampton has, uh, you know, a public transport network, but we'd like to see that, you know, move to a more green capability. The Green Party has plans to increase uh, public transport buses, for example, and find ways to turn that into green energy usage rather than pollution that comes out of buses as well. Um, other aspects as well, things that, in many ways, saddened me in many ways. We, we look in Southampton now. I think there's approximately 11 food banks in Southampton that have sprung up. And I, I, I'm in dismay, really, that you know, if we're the fifth um, most wealthy country in the world and we have food banks and a homeless problem of the scale that we do, something should be able to be done about that. It, to me, it seems like an unacceptable situation. But then inversely, you know, again, with, with, from the Green Party perspective, we look at things like our investment in nuclear technology, nuclear weapons, Trident, for example, 100 billion in that, and we look at that and we say, well, you know, what could we do with that? We could be investing that in, into the NHS. We could be using that to deal with homeless issues. We're looking at aspects like universal basic income that can help bring people out of those sort of poverty type of situations. Um, so there's a, there's a number of aspects on that. It's pretty broad, but uh, I think my, my interests lie both at a local level, but also I believe that we're not alone in the issues that we suffer in, in this area. And it's making sure that if they get driven through, they also get driven through at a national level as well. Thank you, Osman. Thank you. OK. Um, Royston, uh, to you. Good afternoon. My name's Royston Smith. I was until a couple of weeks ago uh, your MP. I'm now a jobbing candidate with all the other jobbing candidates <laughs> on the panel. Um, I'm very much hoping to be going back to my uh, former day job um, in the middle of December. Um, the reason I stood in Southampton in the first place and the reason I still want to is because I was born here, I grew up here, my daughter went to this university, I was, I was on the board of governors for two terms on the Solent University and we talked extensively about this, this new build that you've got and uh, it's uh, fantastic to see it now, for you anyway, because you now uh, benefit from uh, having it and I remember during the time we were talking about it, you know, it was a very difficult sell actually to say to students, <coughs> We're going to build these fantastic facilities, but you guys won't get to use them. So, but now you are here using them, which is really great, and that's something that uh, the university should be uh, proud of. Um, I was a apprentice. I didn't go to university. Um, sometimes I wish I did, but I don't regret the route that I took. I was an engineer. I went into the Royal Air Force, and then I worked um, at British Airways afterwards. When I finished um, in the commercial sector. Um, I became a councillor on Southampton in 2000 and, like Simon, became council leader. Uh, and I was also the chairman of Hampshire Fire and Rescue. Um, as an MP, I've been, I stood for election in 2010 and narrowly missed it by 192, which involved some recounts. And then in 2015, I won with a modest majority. And then in 2015, I went back to the recounts situation again on election night. So I'm, I'm pretty. Uh, used to it being very close. And I think in a way that makes our politics more healthy. Uh, you can go to some leafy suburbs where people are ratcheting up 20 and 30,000 uh, vote majorities. I'm not entirely sure they're as connected with the people they represent <coughs> as people in marginal seats. I'm not entirely sure I want to be in a marginal seat, but I do think that makes a, a difference. And uh, by doing that, you have people nipping at your heels. And every time that happens, incidentally, it makes you think about what you do and perhaps make uh, adjustments or improvements in, in the way that you do things. So opposition is a really 
really good thing, I think, for, for everyone. Um, my priorities when I was an MP was uh, similar to Simon's now, and that is about infrastructure and getting the city moving, uh, not necessarily in transport alone, but of course we do need to have a transport network, and whatever that is, it needs to be able to move around quickly, and buses is a prime example of that, and making sure our road network works is very, very important. Now that's not just to get more cars on the road by any means, in fact, cleaner cars, electric cars, um, no cars if we if we found a way of, uh, of achieving that, but uh, to get the infrastructure working so that the city works and so the economy works, because if the economy doesn't work, then we don't have any of the things that the rest of us want to see. And it's absolutely without question that my priorities would be very similar to other people on this panel. More housing. We don't want people to be homeless. But the way to do that is to build more homes. And in Southampton particularly, we haven't been doing that very well. People will say that we have, but we simply haven't. And Simon said about um, holding them, them ourselves to account about what we do. One of the priorities of the council, um, the Labour Council, was to build one affordable home for every day that they were in office. Well, they haven't done that. Now, that is a criticism, mm -hmm. but there also needs to be uh, a solution. And my solution always was about estates regeneration on our council estates, where the council owns the land and we can build more and better affordable homes for people to live in. So there's a solution, I'm not entirely sure that it's been taken up. Health, absolutely. There's a first thing that everyone needs to know about the NHS. It is not for sale. It doesn't matter what anyone tells you, it is not for sale. It cannot be sold, it's a public service. Now the arguments you hear and then get conflated to throw out this line about the NHS is to be privatised or sold, is about what you've seen in these documents about conversations with pharma companies. But let me just put that into context. When you go to the hospital, and I hope you never have to, but let's just say you had to go to the hospital and have a scan, an MRI scanner. We don't make those. We buy them from General Electric, an American company. If you've got cystic fibrosis and you need or can be, that is a pharmaceutical we buy from an American company. Is it people's uh, idea that we should not do that because we're dealing with America? Or is that privatisation? Well, if there is no privatisation because we don't make scalpels, plasters, nurses, uniforms and aspirins. The public part of the NHS will always be public and what you want, I know what you want, is it will always be free. So I don't think you can put a cigarette paper between any of us on our commitment to the NHS. Simon quite rightly said that the environment is the number one issue that's going to be facing us. There's no question about that. But it's not the only issue. And I'm not dumbing down that in its importance, but we can't not do anything else because we've discovered and decided and now all agreed that the environment is number one. So what is important, and we have to acknowledge this because we wanted to talk about honesty in politics. And what I've tried to do in my time in politics is under promise and over deliver. Because every time you make these great promises that you mostly can't deliver. President Obama's a great example of this. This man could read the telephone directory and I could sit there and listen to it all day long because his oratory was just exceptional. But you really knew that he was never gonna be able to deliver it all because it always sounded so much better than the reality. So under promise and over deliver, and I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. When the referendum for withdrawal from the Uni European Union came in 2016, I said one thing and I meant it. Whatever you decide, we will implement. That's the government line. I said, I will honour whatever it is people say. And I thought we were going to vote to Remain. I was convinced Remain would walk it. But I said I would honour it. And so whether we like Brexit or whether we don't like Brexit, if you want to see what a question of honesty looks like, it's honouring that referendum result. So my, my priorities are the same as the rest on this. Housing, education, people into work, the environment, and making sure that we can be as honest as possible, so that you can trust politicians, even if you don't much like them. Okay. Thank you, Royston. Jack? God, there was so much to pick apart in that. <laughs> um, Jack subbing for Liz Jarvis, by the way. Yeah. I think I mentioned that. Didn't yeah, uh, obviously I can't really tailor it much to Southampton Itchen. Uh, I did go to university in Southampton, but sadly the other one. Uh, don't hold that against me. Um, and I am the uh, parliamentary candidate for New Forest West. Uh, I'm a, a councillor, I'm the opposition housing spokesperson on New Forest District Council, so I do have a bit of experience with regards to the, uh, the homelessness and the, the uh, private rented sector uh, when it comes to housing. 
Uh, but I think we're kidding ourselves if, as you've seen from uh, the Labour and the Conservative candidates so far, is they're trying very hard not to talk about Brexit. Uh, because everything that we do is underpinned by the Brexit issue. Now, it'll make us poorer and less influential in the world. And so that's why the Liberal Democrats want to stop Brexit, because we think it will make Southampton and other areas poorer. Now, there are three main reasons that stopping Brexit is a good idea uh, for Southampton and for other parts of the country. Firstly, it is good for our economy. It means a £50 billion remain bonus and a 0.4% boost to our economy by 2024-2025. Secondly, it means we can actually tackle the biggest issue facing all of us, which is the climate crisis. If we spend the next decade negotiating all the free trade agreements we had before, then we won't have time to actually put in place the requirements or the, uh, the necessary legislation that will mean we get to carbon neutral by 2030 and we'd be able to limit uh, global warming by one point, uh, to 1.5 degrees uh, by 2030, which is the recommended IPCC uh, limit. Also, we can still get the same deal uh, that we have at the moment as members of the European Union if we stop Brexit. Because the European Union, if we stop Brexit, will just go back to what it was before. It means that we can't... Stop taking your head. We, means <laughs> we can't actually lose out, we can only gain. So there's nothing to lose by stopping Brexit. But there's everything to lose if we carry on and can't get the trade deals or the, uh, the, the trade to make up for what we lost before. But there are other issues affecting our country, as you've heard from the other candidates. We've got a housing crisis, not just in Southampton, but across the country, where young people, working class families, can't get a, a home to rent or own simply because there aren't enough houses and there aren't enough social rented houses. And that's why the Liberal Democrats will build 100,000 social rented homes per year over the course of the next parliament, if we're in government. Also, we have a real lack of investment in our public services at the moment. Our schools are underfunded, our teachers are underpaid, and our N NHS is crumbling. We will tackle that by putting a penny in the pound in income tax for the NHS, ring-fenced for mental health uh, equality, so that we can equalise waiting times for mental health with physical health, as well as ending out of area placements as well. So it's an interesting one because you're all students. Now, a lot of people who make decisions in councils, and I've seen it in, at local government, as you can probably tell, I'm one of the youngest councils on New Forest District Council, but actually in Parliament as well, the people that make the decisions are generally of a certain age. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Ageist. Well, <laughs> they're people who, quite frankly, uh, don't have or have forgotten the lived experience of young people in our country and don't really have the, the know-how uh, know to tackle the issues that really matter to you. Because quite frankly, if you're earning, uh, as most MPs do, 70 grand a year or something like that, I mean, I don't know what the actual pay is, but uh, it's something around that much, then you're not really going to understand how, how like me at the moment, I mean, I'm a taxi controller in, in a taxi office. I, I do not have much money at all. And so I know every single day um, how hard it is to get by, to buy food, to buy electric, to buy gas, and simply uh, the cost of living in this country is far too high and the price of everything is far too high. So I, you're, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is your vote really matters, your voice matters, because a lot of people who make decisions don't really listen to you as much as they maybe should. This is your chance at this election to say you want to stop Brexit, to say you want to tackle the climate crisis, and to actually say what is happening at the moment isn't good enough. You demand better. So please uh, do consider uh, voting Liberal Democrat. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Kim? So yeah, Kim Rose from UKIP, but welcome to the new game show of, of um, Would I Lie to You? You know, everyone's saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. What is actually being done? Nothing is being done in this town. I mean, the Tories in 2014, they promised 200,000 start-up homes for young people. How many have they built in five years? Not one. They haven't built one. Now, OK, I, I should have start, I started my speech with, with, um, with there's no, no difference between the Tories, New Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Now, that was a gambit that I gave 25 years ago on when I met a very young Nigel Farage and we went round together giving speeches in a pub in front of 10 people explaining in the first 20 minutes what UKIP meant. You know, we've been fighting for a referendum all our lives. 
We managed to achieve a referendum by putting the, the, the Tories in the corner and Cameron gave us what we wanted. They, they tried to fix it with, with vote leave. We had leave.eu. We were pushed to one side because the Tories took over. You know, the media and the establishment are against UKIP because we speak the truth. So they have slated us as being racists and, 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 and xenophobes and everything else. When, and it's, OK, I know we're the Tommy Robinson bit, but thank God Tommy Robinson's now endorsing Boris Johnson because that makes voice the Nazi on the ex-Nazi. You know, so, you know, getting back to 25 years of hard work of, of an election to, to, to leave the EU, 17.4 million people voted to leave. And it isn't about Brexit now, it's about democracy. You know, we, we listened to, to Jack, okay, there's nothing personal with Jack, but, but I mean, that Joe Swinson, I mean, I've got a list here that, you know, she unilaterally wants to take us out without even referring to the 17.4 million people, and they call themselves Democrats. You know, I mean, she, I've got a list here. She voted, hang on, I haven't got my glasses on. She voted to triple the student um, tuition fees. She voted for privatisation in the NHS. She voted um, to cut welfare for the unemployed. She voted to cut payments for the terminally ill. She voted to cut the education budget, she voted for the bedroom tax, she voted to remove legal aid, she voted to um, tax cuts for millionaires, and she voted to remove workers' protection. It goes on and on what the Liberal Democrats have done. And, you know, I mean, quite frankly, you know, I mean, how, if you go to the polling booths and you're thinking about voting for Lib Dems, remember what I've just said, because all that is true. Everything I've said on that is true. Now, my... My personal reason for standing in Southampton Itchen is I, I was brought up in the docks. OK, I left school at 14. I left with five A-levels and four O-levels, and they, they caught me at the gate, and I had to give them back to the kid they belonged to. And then, but I went to um, uh, Deanery. I played up and down um, Derby Road as a kid, uh, kicking the football. I spent my teens in the Shabines. I haven't exactly... I've had a bit of a checkered pass. It hasn't been all, all, um, all good, I suppose. But I've always been in touch with the people, and... Not saying I'm going to do something, we've actually done things. We've got at the moment, you won't see any homeless next week out on the street because every single one of those homeless have got UKIP leaflets leafleting for me. And the reason they're leafleting for me is because every single one of them nearly come into my shop. Every day I'll give them money and I'll give them a bit of food or something. And I'm not, doing, I'm not saying that this to try and get votes because I don't care if you vote for me or not. I'm just telling you a fact. At the end of the day, those homeless are there. They're not getting any help. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. Those homeless have been there for years. We'll have an election in five years' time and we'll still be talking about the same old drivel. You know, once this election's over, you know, whoever's MP goes off into Parliament and nothing more said. But we, they come back like snow geese here to tell him, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Well, I'm fed up with the going to. Let's actually make a difference. Let's actually have a, a, a cross-party thing about climate change. Let's try to um, sort out the tuition fees. I mean, personally, with UKIP, our manifesto doesn't come out until... This, uh, on Monday, the 2nd, of which I'm spokesman for integration. UKIP's changing. It's going to be an end in front of it. It's UKIP. I've got the Indian High Commission and that bit, um, involved. I've got uh, Russians. I've got a Russian Muslim chap who's been involved in politics. They've got the cruise shop down the road. They've joined UKIP. They're coming with me. I've got a, um, a, a Scottish bloke, absolutely brilliant, this Gordon. He, he's, a, he's a homeless chap but feels really passionate about politics. He's coming up. You know, we're, we're starting an earthy... People's Party shaking off that racist tag because it isn't. Yes, there's been idiots in it, and yes, that Gerard Batten, quite frankly, I didn't get on with him anyway because I've always been on the left side of UKIP. I mean, I, my life, I started off as Socialist Labour in 1997, given speeches of Arthur Scargill. And I was taken by, um, by Nigel Farage as a socialist token to show that UKIP is a broad church of people. And my reason for joining UKIP was because it was always the socialist agenda to leave the EU. I mean, I'm shocked at Jeremy Corbyn's view on it, because if you put him under a lie detector, he, uh, the lie detector, he'd want to leave, you know, because in his heart, if you speak from his heart, he's, he's a Brexiteer. But uh, you can't, you know, he's, he's, he's staying neutral. Respect for him for staying neutral. I'm not running him down. I'm just saying, at the end of the day, that, that's his own personal opinion, because it's always a socialist agenda. So that's where I'm coming from with UKIP. Um, as regards of people in Southampton, education, yes... Uh, you know, it should be STEM subjects, um, and with 
tuition fees uh, with all the, the loans being scrubbed if they work for five years, if they work for five years in this country, scrubbed it, scrubbed it, scrubbed it, the, the debt that they owe, uh, but with other things like some of the, um, I don't know, like uh, sociology and, and other things where it's going to be harder to get jobs, maybe apprenticeships are probably better, maybe working apprenticeships for, for people to, instead of going to university. And, that's a, and also we've got lots of shops that are empty. You know, let's start, um, there's lots of entrepreneurs here that can start their own shop. They, they could have start-ups from, from uh, the council and, and don't, give them, don't pay no rates. So they've got a small shop. I started with a small shop with 50 pounds and an old Corsair. I pushed that down the road and I brought up four kids and 13 grandkids with it. You know, I'm not, that, I'm not exactly like loaded, but you know, we've lived. You know, we've lived a life and now we're trying to give something back. So what I'm saying to you here today is, you know, take on board what everything that, that people are saying. But every time they say they're going to, you know, look at it and say, well, hang on a minute. You know, it should, it should have been done five, two years ago or five years ago. All this I'm going to, we're, set, we're talking about the same subjects now as what we did in 2015. So, I mean, I won't carry on because I'll carry on like a grumpy old man. I'm 63 now. So forgive me if I'm rambling on. And that, but um, I'll, I'll end it now with just saying, you know, you keep us there. We're staying on the pitch. We're staying on pitch for one reason, because Brexit is still there to be had. And, you know, we will stay on the pitch until we achieve a Brexit. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I, th I thought it would be quite a useful exercise, given the audience, by the way, that if we could just have a few words from candidates about whether or not Brexit is a good thing for Southampton itching. I know it's a kind of a much broader issue than that, but is it a good thing for Richin? So I know that Kim's just finished, so I'll go to Jack and then we'll go up and then come back down. So. It's, I mean, my position is... But in a few words, yeah, though, Jack. Yeah, pretty so obvious. Okay, yeah. uh, we would have stopped Brexit because it would be bad for the NHS, it would be bad for the economy, and uh, it would be yeah. bad for our place in the world. OK, thank That's you. Royston? I voted Leave because I don't uh, agree with the Commission, the Parliament and the Court. I don't recognise the flag or the anthem. And the reason I'm sat before you today is because you can remove me from office with a simple cross in a box, which you can't do with the people in Europe. Okay. Is, it a good, is it a good or a bad thing for um, Itchin? I, mean, a, I, a, I a, know a, that Itchin is a Leave. It's a, very, it's a very good thing for Itchin for the reasons that I've highlighted, because yeah. in Southampton, Itchin, as with everywhere else, we have a direct link to your constituency MP and if you don't like what we do uh, on the 12th of December you can kick me out of course you can't do that with the people in the EU so there's a democratic deficit and I think that this country is big enough it is uh, innovative enough and this city is uh, great enough to make its way in the world without having to be part of the political structures of the European Union. Okay. Thank you very much. Osman? Um, well, I'm very much pro Remain, as is the Green Party is. Obviously, as you're probably aware, looking to go back to a people's vote. If I can give you an example of a personal situation, and this is one that echoes with myself and people I know from various other industries. I spent two years working in Berlin with um, manufacturers, uh, global organisations, and the European Commission. We worked together to develop standards and policies that benefit the UK and the rest of Europe. If I feel if we move out of Europe and we have a Brexit situation, then our role to play in those sort of areas becomes very weak. Now, this will absolutely have an impact on, on jobs, on the benefits we get from the decision-making and policies that come into that, and it even ripples into the manufacturing and the commercial aspects of products that go onto the shelves in the UK, because we end up in a situation where things become a little bit more bespoke for the UK. I use the, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, the Betamax VHS type conundrum, but it's that kind of situation that we risk going into when for the last however many decades, people across so many industries have worked to develop standards and policies that have actually benefited the UK. So I think it's a, it's a terrible thing to leave. OK. Thank you, Osman. Simon? Well, I campaigned for Remain, and I haven't changed my mind on that. Uh, I'm uh, you know, a pragmatist, really. I remain and reform. The EU does need reform. But my two principal reasons were 
I thought certainly in the short to medium term this country would be poorer, we'd have less resources to spend on vital public services and as the leader of the council at the time I felt I didn't want to make any more cuts and I'd prefer to have the resources come into the city so we can spend it on the services I outlined. And the second thing is uh, I'm, I think that broadly there are three principal power blocks in the world, uh, the European Union, the United States and China and I thought Britain would be more powerful in the world if it was part of uh, uh, the European Union and effectively could project our view, our tolerance and our liberal democracy through that ethos in a world environment. And so they were my principal reasons. The Labour position is, is the same as the Greens, it's for uh, a second referendum. You cannot just cancel something that 17.4 million have voted for. I don't think a lot of people knew exactly what they were voting for. And now we have a clear, we will have a clear Brexit position. People know what they're going to go for, and that should be mandatory, not this faffing around in Parliament business. Either we go for the deal that's on offer, or we remain. And that's the Labour position. OK, thank you. Kim? OK, well, I suppose I can't say I'm sitting on the fence. No, you can't. <laughs> on this one. <laughs> um, with the EU, I mean, when UKIP had, we had all the MEPs, they put forward 83 motions within the European Parliament 83 or 84 of them were all turned down. You say we've got to say, we haven't got to say, we're actually dictated to. You know, if, they, if we take away our habeas corpus laws and we have corpus juris and, and we get sucked in, in into this, I mean, I've got a thing here, this is from um, well, Marion Le Pen, but I mean, she said, the European Union is not Europe, it is an ideology without land, without people, without roots, without soul and without civilization. The European Union is slowly killing millennial nations. You know, this is more than the EU. The EU is uh, a brainchild of something much, much bigger. Well, I'm not going to go into like Bilderberg and New World Order. But, you know, they actually control and govern the whole world and, and, and they're trying to make sure that the EU, they will not let us leave one way or the other. That's why they've got the, even the Tories, they've got the Tories, all the main parties in their pocket. But, you know, Boris Johnson would turn around and say he's going to do a Brexit deal. Well, Theresa May's deal was a surrender treaty, and Boris Johnson's deal was only about 10% better than that. You know, if we take that deal, quite frankly, we might as well remain in the EU because it would be better than leaving on those terms. You know, so, I mean, we're advocating a, a, a clear-cut uh, uh, Brexit. I mean, I don't even like the the word no deal Brexit, because that was something that was invented by the EU last year because it's like a, a, a negative, where it says no deal Brexit and it puts people off. But the fact is, let me finish oh, this right, Oh right, yeah, yeah, because I just did, did, did say a few words. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just a okay. few words. Yeah, but, 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 but you put me up the stroke now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the fact is, with, with, with Brexit, you know, there's only one way, it's a clear cut Brexit where we've got free trade. I mean, it's not a no-deal Brexit. It's a thousands and thousands of deal Brexit. We can trade with the whole world. You know, we are a great nation. You know, you know we, we survived before we ever had the EU. And I know it's difficult for you all here because you're a younger generation and you're used to what you're used to. And then also, you know, you've been sort of, you've had this common purpose education where you've been brainwashed slightly with respect. And it's, but it's not your fault. You know, you know I, I, all I'm asking you for is, now and again, when you, when you ask, when you ask um, some inf information, instead of asking like the teachers or university, ask your nan, ask your granddad. They'll tell you what the life was like before we ever joined the EU. Okay. Thank you, Kim. So her question is, this is from Violet Webb, um, what are your intentions for policy decisions affecting disabled, the disabled community, PIP, universal credit, accessibility requirements in government, business and education? So that's to Royston, and it's with reference um, to that section of the Conservative Manifesto, which talks about the national strategy for disability. Uh, over to you, Royston. Okay, well, firstly, I think that um, Conservatives have a proud record on disability rights. It was William Hague that um, brought the... Well, you may not remember, but it was actually um, the former leader of the Conservative Party, William Hague, that brought the disability discrimination bill that then became the Act through Parliament. Um, and although you may have a view entrenched or otherwise, there are some things that are factual and there are some things that are subjective and that is a factual one. Um, more importantly, we believe in the way that we believe that the quickest route out of poverty is for people to be able to access work. And it's not just because they can earn money, it's because it does 
much more for them personally. You know, people's mental health is so much better when they are with other people and in a working environment where they feel valued, where they feel that they're making a contribution. So there are a million more uh, disabled people in work since we came into government than there were before that. And that is something to be very proud of. And part of that is being able to give people access to extra resource and support in order that they can do that. And that would be the same as if they wanted to access education, um, including personal budgets, including universal credit, including personal independent payments. Those things are a record that we should be proud of and that we are proud of and that we will continue to do uh, in the event that we return to government on the 13th of December. Thank you, Royston. So in the Conservative Manifesto, mm -hmm. there, there is a discussion about a national strategy. So I think I go to Simon um, next because th there is a, a slight variation <coughs> on the um, national strategy from in the Labour Manifesto, which is about... I hope I'm not speaking for you, Simon, by the way, when I say this, but I'm just reading these this morning. Which is, it's again, it's about this, the National Independent Living Support Service. Um, and so th th there are slight variations on the uh, theme, but there's also some uh, issues about uh, reassessments. So hopefully I haven't given too much away what some might have to say on this, but it, it is about the, um, the NILSS, effectively, I think the question is. Okay, well, the first point to say, of course, is that, that all these issues are about resourcing. And there was a political decision made back in, in 2010 when the Liberal Democrats and Conservatives came into power that one place they would go looking for savings was the, the benefits budget. And they were you know, quite open about this. They said, oh, basically, uh, they had a narrative which said that people we, that, w that were being supported by benefits uh, in the, in the wider population were somehow scroungers and therefore they could be uh, uh, politically isolated from the rest of the population. And there was a 12 billion pounds of, of benefit cuts that went through in that first uh, uh, parliament. And, and of course that was doubled down on when the Conservatives unexpectedly won a, a majority in 2015 uh, because they put into their manifesto another load of benefits cuts which they expected to be able to negotiate away in coalition talks and they didn't. And of course so that was a double hit. So it's all very well putting through whatever legislation you like in Parliament, but if you don't back it up with some money and resources, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. And so it's always, all, politics is really about raising money and deciding how you spend it. And effectively, the, the money has not been put into this area, and therefore, well, Royston is, is absolutely right that we should be supporting people with disabilities into an effective role in society, into jobs and work. That only happens if you're prepared to put the money in, and I don't think the Conservatives have and therefore the Labour Manifesto reflects that position and we will commit to making that investment. So, sorry to keep cutting in by the way, but it's just, so I'm just trying to read into this question. So, um, is there any decision currently on the fate of universal credit? So I think, I can't quite remember what Royston's position is, but I think it's, it's going to be refined. It's being refined all the time. Yeah. Um, universal credit, I think, is the right way to administer our benefit system. Yeah. And I'm not alone in thinking that. It was a Labour construct. Um, uh, Frank Field, who I worked with on the Department of Work and Pensions mm -hmm. Select Committee, was a big uh, proponent and fan of universal credit. Mm -hmm. What's happened, and this is, this, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise, but we have to acknowledge it and we have to sort it, um, mm -hmm. is that when you introduce a system as large as this and as complex as this, it won't just happen the day after and all go smoothly. Now, we'd like it to, and we wanted it to, and we hoped it would, but of course it hasn't always gone according to plan. So we've you know, changed the way that it's administered, we're changing the way that it is, and we're looking at how we can find that and make it better. But of course we've had pilots in some areas and not in others, and so you see differences in the way it's been administered. The six weeks was too long, yeah. uh, the five weeks, some may argue, is still too long. But of course you have to work on the assumption that universal credit isn't just to put people on a benefit and leave them there forever is the idea is to try and get people into you know meaningful roles in education uh, in, in, in employment and the rest and one of the parts of going into employment of course is you get paid at the end of the month after you've done your your, your shifts and you know you pay your uh, rent and mortgage or whatever it is um, 
And that's what universal credit is trying to do. So it's also, not only is it giving people enough in order for them to live their lives, but it's also trying to help them when they go back into work to understand what it is like to be in work. Because a lot of people, you know, I know this is a, an awful thing, an indictment of our society, and it's something that I've been campaigning against for as long as I can remember, but there are lots of people that have never been in work. Mm. And even to get them into work, it's a massive step change to their life. So universal credit is designed to help that. Thank you. Jack? Um, yeah, so I would say actually, because um, it's interesting <clears throat> hearing, because it's very politicised, the debate around uh, universal credit and PIP and everything like that. Uh, obviously, the Liberal Democrats are uh, in favour of the idea of universal credit. It is a good idea to simplify the benefit system into one uh, uh, accessible kind of welfare. But it's kind of, it ruins the system when you put it in the hands of, uh, as it was originally done, Ian Duncan Smith because the Tories aren't really understanding of the situation with regards to people, uh, or the very poorest people in our society. And what we would do is we'd keep universal credit, but we'd make changes. So we'd you know, uh, increase the working allowance, we'd reduce the, kind of the length of time it takes to get payments, uh, we'd also scrap the work capability assessments, uh, and we would uh, reinstate the independent living allowance. Now, I, I do want to come back to something Simon said, because he did uh, challenge uh, the, the Liberal yes. Democrats on their record in coalition, uh, and quite rightly, um, the Liberal Democrats did uh, play a part in some quite uh, difficult decisions. But let's not forget that the country was in an economic crisis back in uh, 2010, and we were facing the prospect of another election. And so actually, uh, all parties proposed to cut the budget, to, to go down an austerity route and Labour would have cut more than the coalition actually did. So it is a, a situation where there's a bit of historical revisionism uh, present within the current lot of uh, the Labour Party because they turn around and say, oh, well, it was a few years ago, it was anything to do with us. Well, actually, if a party can't learn from its past, then actually we won't have any sort of future if all we do is look to the past and say, well, you know, 10 years ago we did that. If a party can't learn from its mistakes, then quite frankly, uh, our politics is worse for it. So actually on an issue of trust, because I didn't actually touch on this uh, before. No, um, yeah, go ahead, Jack, Jack, go ahead. Uh, On an issue of trust, actually, uh, the, Liberal, the Liberal Democrats did make many mistakes in coalition, bedroom tax and the, uh, the legal aid and everything like that. Uh, obviously, we'd scrap bedroom tax because we've learned our lesson uh, on that. Uh, but actually, a party that has broken their promises, which Come on, Nick Clegg did break his promises in 2010. Uh, I believe, uh, and I have uh, kind of first-hand experience of this, a party would not uh, make those mistakes again. And I think we know better than most parties actually out there that we shouldn't uh, promise stuff that we can't deliver. Uh, and this time we've been very clear on that, that we will not be promising stuff that we can't deliver, uh, which is why we've uh, been quite clear on where we stand on Brexit and also on the climate crisis and other issues. Okay, thank you, Jack. Awesome. Um, yes, um, I think at the moment, this, uh, with regards to these various things, PIP, universal credit, and so on, this is a, this to us, I think, feels like system failure, frankly. Um, you know, talking about you know lessons learned, making mistakes. I mean, frankly, when you're dealing with those kind of systems that are really dealing with the poorest in in our country, you're actually you don't have the headroom to make mistakes. You don't have the headroom to allow people to end up becoming homeless because of those situations. So frankly, with the Green Party, we're, we're looking at <coughs> essentially replacing out that system completely with using universal basic income. Um, that will ensure that adults get a 89 pounds a week, which is uh, an amount that we think uh, would cover enough for basic living. We're looking at a living wage. We're looking at supplementing um, universal basic in income for people with disabilities. And Violet's question was specifically around the disabled community. Uh, the mm -hmm. Green Party yes. does have a disabled uh, policy working group. Um, which looks very closely at what can be done to benefit people in the community in those areas and how those various policies all ripple through to take advantage of that. We, we look at it at the moment that the current system isn't broken. It's, it, it is broken, sorry. It would be, a, it'd be very hard to fix it, and it's, it's in need of replacement with something that's more appropriate, frankly. Um, she also mentioned ed education there as well. Um, fundamentally, we're looking at scrapping the tuition fees for further education as well to alleviate some of those burdens on that side of it as well. Okay, thank yep. you. Kim? Um, 
Yesterday, because my wife is is only got like fifteen percent vision left, and we had a chap come around yesterday with um, his guide dog, he's blind, with his assistant, and they were fantastic. You know, they came around, and because the doctors t um, tell them to come around, so they're, they're assessing our needs and the things that we need. And um, I, I can't speak more highly the, the way they treated us. You know, um, I, I was talking to the blind chap and mentioned I was going to come here today about PIP and Universal Credit. He said, I'd love to come, I'd love to speak. He said, but I couldn't possibly speak for you, kid. And, and I said, I do understand that. I said, but, um, but you know, what he was saying, and you know, because you know, we ask politicians things, and, and you know, say so it's like border control. You know, rather than talk to a politician about border control, we're much better off talking to a retired customs officer. You know, people that are experienced in that field. And you know, the, the subject I felt was very touching is the fact that People have got to wait five weeks. But how do they last five weeks with no money? You know, that, it, it can't be done. You know, there must be enough money. They're talking about billions, of, you know, the, the Labour one about spending, I think it's about 120 trillion or something, which is like a crazy figure. Uh, and, um, you know, five, five weeks money, I'm sure that people could actually, you know, have that money in advance. And also for assessments every three years. You know, they shouldn't have to be assessed. If they're disabled, they're disabled. Yes, uh, okay, there was a case of a chap that had a heart attack, and then he, he very lucky, he built himself back up when he was caught playing football, you know, so, and he was still claiming his benefits. Obviously, you're going to get one or two sick within that, but the majority, they shouldn't have to keep going back every three years to be assessed. You know, there should be a lot more care in the community, and, and you know, it's not just... You know, we're talking about something now that's humanitarian. It isn't politics, it's humanitarian. It's only right that people have money in advance so they can live. Mm -hmm. And they can buy a bit of food and they can just live an ordinary life. You know, where's the harm in that? Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, because Violet's not here, I mean, if, if there was a question from the floor, from the audience regarding this, that you wanted to put to any of the five candidates, uh, feel completely free to speak. Go ahead. So, what's your name? Sam. Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Um, you guys talk about holding a second referendum. Now, besides the fact, obviously, of oh. what. Sorry, was it <laughs> I purely meant on. Specifically about this. Okay, that's fine. I do have one of that. Um, you talked then about having a universal basic income and also scrapping university fees. Who's paying for that? We, we, we have that costed in our in our systems. That's been well thought through. Granted, the Green Party is looking at taking loans to do certain things, particularly when, where the climate emergency is concerned as well. Yeah. But, uh, but it, is a funded, it is a funded proposition. So. Funded from weather, because there's already, there's already a shortage of, you know, there's not enough money in the benefit system in the NHS and stuff, so if you need more, wh where's that going to come from? That's, that's my question. That's a good question. <laughs> oh, so, so do you mean th this is the funding? So obviously this is still related to the question, which is... That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're saying that the benefit system is underfunded or the promises that are being made, are, they co uh, are you asking if they're fully constant? You know, I'm, I'm acknowledging obviously that, that there's work that needs to be done. Um, but you, 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 a lot of you guys agreed that part of it comes with, you said raise, you, policy is about raising money and then deciding how to spend it. What's your plan, obviously, because this is going to need a lot more investment, a lot more of revision. How, how do, you, do you have a plan to how you're going to raise that money? We do have a plan to do that. There, there is funding already in the system for the existing system to exist. So it's a case of redistributing that, reassessing how that gets divvied up as well. Um, as you know, it's all done on a lot of checks and criteria that actually cause delays in the system as well, and there's a lot of overhead and costs that comes with that as well. So actually, in many ways, going to a simpler system, which removes a lot of overhead, actually reduces the cost of operating that system, which can then go back into benefiting people as well. So that's an aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Simon, yeah, go ahead. It's a, it's a fair challenge. It's a fair point, because effectively you can't spend money you haven't got. You know, the, uh, basically, what the Conservatives and whoops, the first half of the Lib Dems and then on their own have done is uh, on the taxation system is they've systematically cut corporation tax. See, we started out at about 27%, which is broadly in line with the European average. It's the same as in France, 1% more than Germany. And they've cut it to 19. So that, that's an 8% reduction in corporation tax. And that is uh, basically about the 23, 24 billion pounds a year. And that, that, that tax is, is levied on the profits of large corporations. And so the Labour policy is to return that tax to where it was in 2010. 
uh, in line with virtually every European country, where they're all 25, 26 or 27, and then use that resource to invest in public services. Principally, uh, I think that's where the tuition fees issue is covered off and uh, some of the other expenditure as well. So that's an example. I could go to all the other list of other taxes, but that's a good example. Mm. And if you add up the numbers going back over 10 years, we'd have an extra, well in excess of 250 billion pounds of money in the public system and, and not in the, the, the hands of corporations. But Thank you. Um, Royston wanted to come in. I just want to pick up on that point because that's not entirely accurate. Since we cut corporation tax, We've not only created a thousand new jobs every single day of us being in office, but we've collected nine billion pounds more in corporation tax than we were when it was at 28%. So actually, that doesn't necessarily follow. You can turn around and say that 1% of this will give you X, scale it up over 10 years and say, well, that comes to that figure, but it doesn't necessarily. So that is not true. We actually took in nine billion pounds more in corporation tax than we took when the corporation tax was higher. But the best way to get the money to fund public services is to have a strong economy. And if you do something that weakens that, and excessive borrowing weakens that. Just a quick uh, thought for you all. We pay 50 billion pounds a year in interest. In interest. That will double under a Labour government, just in their borrowing, not including their tax and spend, just in their borrowing. 50 billion pounds a year is 1,500 pounds a second, or 75,000 pounds per minute that we have to pay to pension funds and others in order to maintain our borrowing. So if we do all these things on borrowing, as some of these people suggest, the economy will shrink. If the economy shrinks, there's less money. If there's less money, your public services struggle. Okay. Yeah, I was going to bring in Jack, because I think he was going to tell you, was, I'm not hoping to jump in, there's a penny on the basic rate of income tax, which will go to the National Health yeah. Service. So this is funding for public services. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got a couple of, kind of our uh, manifesto is fully costed, uh, and actually we've, what we've done is said that we will run a, um, a budget surplus of 1% for day-to-day uh, -day spending, uh, but we will borrow, uh, because there are low interest rates at the moment, for capital spending, for capital uh, infrastructure. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to restore the uh, rate of corporation tax to about 20%. We don't think that uh, restoring it uh, to something anything above like 25 would actually be uh, good for the economy because what really matters is that we have a strong economy um, for uh, investment in public services and so that we're not, uh, I mean, kind of similar to Royston, Royston's forgetting the fact that the uh, Conservative uh, Party have actually uh, pledged to spend as, uh, not as much as Labour but have pledged to spend a little bit more uh, but they haven't really funded it properly uh, in that regard. Uh, they probably, would you be borrowing for day-to-day -day spending? I think you should speak to the audience. Okay, well, you know. Uh, uh, they, they're going to borrow for day-to-day -day spending, and that's just simply not sustainable. Uh, so really, we're going to fund it by restoring corporation tax, uh, and also, as uh, previously said, we, there will be a small rise uh, on income tax as well, uh, as well as, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, removing capital gains tax as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I was just... Really quick question on that because yeah. of what Royston um, said about, um, and I don't know if I understood this correctly, but you said that your corporation tax plan um, had raised more money than you would have expected um, if you had had higher corporation tax. If that was bringing more money into the government, why did your government continue to cut things like the amount going into the benefits system or social care? if you were having more money coming in? Because that's only one aspect of taxation, so that brought in nine billion more than it otherwise would have done. But we also invested more in the NHS and we've invested more in lots of public services. For example, mm -hmm. when we decided uh, in 2010 to ring fence health spending because it's the most important thing to people, it was the former health secretary, uh, 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 Andy Burnham, that said that to do that would be reckless. So the money that we've raised in things like corporation tax, we've used to not just ring fence, but to invest more in things like NHS. But as you know, these bills go up all the time. So if we said we've just taken in nine billion more in corporation tax, and therefore we haven't funded some of the public sector, it's not because it's languishing away in somebody's, you know, under somebody's bed. It's because there is only a finite amount of money. And if the economy isn't strong, if we don't continue to drive the economy, keep people in work, extra tax receipts rather than extra benefits, then our economy gets weaker and our public services struggle. And that's just the reality of, of, of economics. So you say that your corporation tax policy hasn't really strengthened the economy? No, I'm not saying that. 
but you're saying you don't have a strong economy, so that's why. No, I'm not saying that. No, no, you're not trying to catch no, me out. No, no, what I'm saying, well, let me, let me answer I'm that then. What I'm saying is it's stronger than it otherwise would have been. I mean, it's quite straightforward. Okay. Nine billion in is stronger than nine billion out, or not okay. nine billion in. Yeah. So it's stronger than it otherwise would have been. Okay. I just take one more question, which I think was the woman at the back. No, I think it was you. Yeah. Was it? Oh, right, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So what's your name? Uh, Courtney. Courtney. So, Courtney. Um, you're I have a question. It's kind of directly at Worcester. Um, it's coming from somebody whose family relies exclusively on universal credit, housing benefit, care and disability allowance and motability, as I have two severely autistic brothers who don't attend school and my parents are unable to work as a result. Um, I find it really interesting, Royston, how you can say that you think universal credit is a great system, um, and then the Conservatives are doing really well in regards to the welfare state, yet you've consistently voted against spending more on benefits and the welfare state. Um, in 2016, you voted for cuts to housing benefit, which my mum relies on. In 2016, you voted for cutting universal credit for those in work, and then I think most disgustingly, in 2015, you voted in favour of proposed benefit spending cuts in favour of more spending for nuclear weapons. So I don't understand how you can say these things with a conscience when you're voting to cut benefit for things that my family rely on in favour of nuclear weapons, which doesn't benefit anybody. Um, well, it doesn't benefit somebody. It doesn't benefit that. anybody because no, we're not think, currently at we'll war, actually. Is that question later on? We can do that later on when that comes on. Um, as for my voting record, yes, I voted for those welfare changes, and I'll tell you why I voted for some of them. Uh, housing benefit was not capped and nor were benefits capped. So if you lived in London, and these are isolated cases, I, I grant you, and it's in a specific place rather than it would be in Southampton. If you lived in London and your uh, house for your family cost a thousand pounds a week, that was paid by housing benefit, and you would never ever go to work, because you couldn't, because you could never move from a benefit situation to a work situation when your outgoings were so high, but they were paid for by benefits. So what we did and what I vote for was to cap benefits at 26,000 a year and then we push back on that too. And the whole point of that is to try and encourage people into work, which we've done at the rate of 1,000 people a day. Now your specifics, and I, I don't know the specifics of yours, so I can't really uh, either, well, I wouldn't want to try and get into it and I can't really be expected to. But when you're talking about those particular things that of which my voting record is demonstrable and that's why it's there, and aren't we lucky that we live in a society where you can see exactly what I've done you can take a view and then you can kick me out if that's what you feel like. Not lots of other places you wouldn't get that, that, that luxury. That's why we live in one of the best countries, if not the best country in the world. The reason I voted for those changes to welfare is because they were counterproductive for people going to work. But what I also voted for, and you've glossed over that, is I voted to uh, introduce the national living wage, in, voted to increase the national living wage, and I'm going to, if get back on the 13th of December, vote again to increase that to £10.50 an hour for people. So these things are not in isolation, but they may affect you disproportionately, but I don't know the circumstances of that. At the end of the day, I mean, I mean with respect to Royston, I mean, I mean Royston voted to take £30 a week away from the disabled when he, he was earning thousands of pounds a week and so as an MP plus other perks. You know, and now sit here and try and justify and say, well, we're making these cuts because it's going to be it's complete nonsense. You know, we're sitting here today listening to, to, to a fairy story and we're just going through the motions. At the end of the day, we shouldn't vote for cuts for anything. Does, does anybody have a... Go ahead. Sorry, what's your name? Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, go ahead, Charlotte. So, who, who's this... Is this a general question? And... It's a general okay, question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, my mum's disabled and she relies on domiciliary care, care is coming into her home. But unfortunately, the council only pay so much, and my mum is responsible for paying the rest. But she doesn't have, because of her benefits, she's actually unable to work due to her disability. She cannot work. So raising the living wage for her does nothing for her. How can we support people in terms of lowering the cost of their care down for those people that can't afford it when they're on benefit? To you want to address this to somebody? There is. I mean, you're, I'll come to you next time. There is. There is. There is a problem. There is a demonstrable problem in care. And the question, which I think we've sort of done, but we, we, we didn't, uh, it touches on that. And and we have something like a hundred thousand vacancies in care in this country. And there is an issue and a problem. And it is difficult to know how to deal with that. I mean. 
the, again, about individual cases, it's very difficult to, it's, you know, without seeing it personally, I don't know. Um, but there is a problem with that, and it is really, really difficult to, a difficult nut to crack. So, it, some people are just made to be in, in the care sector, you know, that is how they are, and they're very good at it, and I have nothing but respect for people that do that. My mother um, is in a care home with dementia, and the people that look after her are just exceptional, and I... I constantly wonder how they how they do it. She's not she's not terribly easy to deal with, frankly. But they do, and they are just absolutely wonderful. But in the, that sector, and the same as, as you're talking about, is, is is there's a problem. And one of the problems is, and we sort of make this problem a bit ourselves. So if we if we incre increase the national living wage, and it's, I think every supermarket but one are paying more than people are being paid in the care sector. So from one point we fix a problem one way, and then we well, perhaps we've created the problem the other way, and you know that there's no question that it, that that exists. Um, on the substantive issue about how you pay for that care, I mean, without seeing the the full detail, I wouldn't really like to to say, but I do know that there is a problem in in care in this country, and it does need to be fixed. When it doesn't need to be fixed, if I can be really honest with you, is right in the middle of a general election campaign, and we know that's what cost last time. I think that we wanted to demonstrate that we wanted to get this social care in general sorted out. It was put into a manifesto, completely misunderstood, or understood, depending on your viewpoint, um, and it, it all ended badly. So what you need is cross-party. Uh, what you need is something that everyone can sign up to. It's, it's, it's like climate change. We all need to agree what the problem is and pretty much agree in one way or another how we deal with it. Yeah, thank you. And I think, not to speak for Royston, but I think there is a promise. This is in social care. There is a promise in the manifesto. Mm. I think, it, is it the amount of four billion? Yes, it is, and, and it's also this, 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 this statement it's that no one should have to sell their own home to pay for their care. Yes. Uh, and that's a quite bland statement, I know, but it's very specific, but it doesn't go into detail, because when it went into detail, in the heat and battle of a general election campaign, that's the last time you should do it. Set out your stall, mm -hmm. be able to defend it, cost it, def you know, whatever it is, but don't have something that's half-baked, because it doesn't work. So, you know, we need to deal with this. Everyone knows we need to deal with it. This government, as much as every other government, has been too slow to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Simon. Yeah, that's right. But, I mean, absolutely. One point we agree on: there is 100,000 vacancies in social care, and the reason for that is because social care uh, workers are not valued like they should be. Uh, he keeps calling it the national living wage. It's actually the minimum wage, which has gone up a bit. Uh, I think Labour's due to bring in from the first month of the government a new £10 minimum wage for you know all ages. But the care sector, if you ever visit lots of care homes, and I have, is, is dominated by uh, people that have, have come from different parts of Europe and different parts of the world to work in this country. And if we tightened up on, on immigration too much, then the 100,000 vacancies would rapidly turn into a quarter of a million vacancies and the system would collapse. We need to recognise that, you know, that people have come into this country to do that useful work and we need to reward them appropriately. And I know that Conservatives really push on this, we've created all these jobs. But my experience of talking to people on the doorstep in other places is a lot of those jobs are insecure. They involve around zero hours contracts. Lots of people are working two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And this is not quality work. And so we need to work collectively as a society. And I would agree with the point about there being a cross-party consensus on social care. I called for it at the last election and the one before, and we, we must get away from this pointing and saying yours is a death tax and yours is a dementia tax because we've got to find a way to pay for it because mm. it's not going to get any better. Dementia particularly is mm. going to be uh, an issue which is, unless there's some miraculous cure, uh, an issue that's going to be impacting on a population that is getting ever elderly. And every council in the country, Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, is struggling to, to finance social care effectively. And so we need to acknowledge that, not play games with it, and actually put the money in to reward people and give them secure pathways in, in terms of careers, keep them in, in the care sector, and treat the most vulnerable people in our society with the respect that they deserve. Thank you. Jack, you wanted to? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'd agree with what, uh, what those two say in terms of the... Uh, we need a cross-party, long-term funding settlement for uh, health and social care in this country. We are in the, in the midst of a social care crisis. I would say that actually the Conservatives have cut uh, or gutted the social care budget or the adult health and social care budget in Hampshire. 
Uh, they've left the staff of a skeleton crew, and it means that frontline services are suffering. Now, what we need to do uh, is get together and uh, over the course of the next parliament decide uh, exactly how, whether we will or not, uh, obviously uh, is another thing entirely, but we need to get together and say, look, uh, we have a staffing crisis in the NHS uh, and in health and social care in general, and actually a lot of those people who uh, work in our health and social care sector are EU uh, citizens, EU nurses, mm. uh, who come over to work uh, in our mm. country. My sister is a dementia, uh, or was a dementia uh, carer, and now works in, uh, uh, as a uh, healthcare assistant in uh, the hospital where, uh, in my town. And a lot of the nurses there are EU uh, citizens. And so actually the biggest threat, in my opinion, to uh, the staffing crisis is uh, leaving the European Union, uh, because it means we tighten up uh, our borders, but it means we lose all those nurses and uh, other staff who actually uh, do such a brilliant job in caring for our uh, uh, ageing population, especially when it comes to dementia. So actually I would say while it's good uh, that we all agree that there is a cross-party uh, consensus that we need a long-term funding settlement uh, for the NHS and social care, actually um, the biggest threat to that is leaving the European Union because it means that it makes us poorer and it loses us uh, a great deal of staff. Okay, thank you, Jack. Okay, I just took some very, just a couple of very brief contributions because I'm a little bit conscious the, the of the time. Been waiting for a long time, out there. This lady here. Oh, Lorenza, yes, go ahead. So my name is Lorenza, and I want to ask one question. So, how do you plan to involve students in the decision-making prospects, in the decision-making process of all of the prospects that you have expressed in your manifesto? And secondly, just. Just uh, for, for the sake of curiosity, I, I want to ask if women are given a pride of place in the election process because I see the whole mm -hmm. gender are male. Yes, yeah. very well. Mm -hmm. Come on, Osmond, thank you. <laughs> there wasn't a willing hand <laughs> there, by the way. <laughs> no, I think the big tough party, we have the young queens. Start. We've got a lot of young people that are actually involved in the party. It's, it's a good thing to see. I mean, even even my, my son is involved in it in, in various ways. Um, so there is an opportunity for a voice from young people to filter back into the party. Um, you're possibly aware that we're looking at um, reducing the voting age to 16 as well to allow those opinions because uh, I think to simply look at it, if you're old enough to go to work and old enough to pay taxes, you should have the right to vote as well on, on various things. So um, so that's an aspect that we're, we're looking at as well. So we, we're very inclusive in that perspective. We think that, you know, young people are the next generation. You're going to be, you know, taking our place in the future. And all the situations that arise at the moment, whether it's social care, through to climate change, any, any of that aspect of things, you guys have the right to have your opinions filtered into, into the party. And in our party, certainly, the Young Greens was created specifically for for that reason, to allow those those opinions and views of people that even could be potentially y younger than the age of voting actually have a place to have a voice. Um, with regards to um, the gender aspects of our party, you're right, there's a very male-dominated here today, but certainly there's a lot of uh, females in, in our party for sure. Our, our only MP, Caroline Lucas, is a female. So we, we don't have any issues on the gender imbalance aspects at all. In fact, um, on, on the contrary, we are very inclusive as a party and we try to ensure that right across the board whether it's gender or race or any aspects of that these are these are not an issue for our party. Jack. Jack. Yeah um, so first I'll start on the gender aspect um, obviously uh, us here are not exactly the, uh, the shining <laughs> example of gender equality <laughs> uh, but the Liberal Democrats have a female leader uh, Joe Swinson who has majored on um, basically making uh, gender equality part and parcel of what our party is about. So we would uh, sort out the gender pay gap, that's a big issue uh, which Joe Swinson played a, a big role in uh, during the coalition government, uh, was uh, kind of getting uh, women on the boards of FTSE uh, companies and also uh, in terms of actually addressing the kind of root causes of gender, uh, of the gender pay gap. Now we're also uh, big on uh, childcare, uh, we'd increase uh, our fully funded childcare um, for 35 uh, hours per week, uh, which would then mean, uh, which it, it sounds, um, we, I'm trying to think how to word this, because it's always a difficult question, uh, difficult answer. Uh, when it comes to childcare, 
It shouldn't be the case, but it is, that it usually uh, predominantly uh, overwhelmingly impacts on women uh, in terms of being the parent, uh, despite what, what progress should be, that it should be equal, but actually at the moment it does predominantly impact women. So we would increase uh, childcare to 35 hours per week, fully funded, uh, and we'd also do that from uh, nine months. So we do have this uh, policies targeted at uh, women, um, but obviously there's, there's kind of a whole raft that kind of comes in uh, improving the quality of life for all people uh, as well. Now with regards to young people, we do believe in uh, reducing the voting age to 16. Uh, young people are uh, the, the future of our country, and quite frankly, if you're eligible to pay taxes, you should be eligible to have a say in how those taxes are spent. So I go very just very some very brief comments because we are really seriously running out of time. So I go Simon Royston and Kim just to, just maybe a few yeah of course um, yeah, one just of, a few one comments. Of my, one of my favourite sayings is one of Martin Luther King's, which is the arc of history bends towards justice. And of course, if you look back at the history of, of women's rights in this country, it's been Labour governments consistently that have, that have actually improved the situation going through time. And we've had a policy for probably over a. 15 years now of all women shortlists and if, if you look at the Parliamentary Labour Party after this election, half of them will be female. Mm. I think we're up to that point now, which does fairly reflect uh, the population and that's absolutely as it should be because you need to reflect the people that you seek to represent. And if you don't do that, then effectively you're not being as effective a uh, political party as you should be. So I've got to say some other things, but I'll stop there because okay. I know we're short yeah, time. thank you. It's really important. The question is really important. I would say that you know the Conservative Party have been more inclusive than people will give us credit for. So, for example, the first woman MP, two prime ministers, first woman as uh, defence secretary, uh, several women as home secretary, and our cabinet is more diverse now than it's ever been with uh, gender, with religion, um, with um, sexuality. It's more diverse than it ever was. And I'll just say this: in 2015, when I was elected. There were 74 Conservative MPs. They weren't all men, they weren't all white, and they weren't all university graduates. And I was very proud of that. Thank you. Kim? Yeah, well, at the moment, <coughs> our manifesto has been um, released at Westminster on the 2nd, on Monday. And it's been written by, by five, or six, five, five or six, every single one's a woman that's written our, man our manifesto when it comes out, because we're at the cameras there. Now, look at the UKIP manifesto, you get the shock of your life when you see it. In 2015, the UKIP manifesto was the only manifesto that was costed. It was so good that the Tories have taken all UKIP's ideas now and used it for their 2019 manifesto. You know, when it comes like to um, an Australian point system. And it, it was a UKIP idea that the Tories have taken on. So, you know, we don't mind. If, if, if we come across with ideas three or four years later, a mainstream party takes it on, at least we're achieving our goal. So, I mean, all I can say to you on, on the side of, of equality, women have never been equal. They're, they're, they're more smarter than men, always have been. And that you can see us coming a mile off, even before we've got down the road. You know, and, and you know, when you see this manifesto that comes out, I'm just asking you, please, look at it, look at it online, just to, to go across it and, and form an opinion and see what you think. And I'll leave the phone number for everyone. Please give me a call and let me know whether it's rubbish or whether you like it. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, is Daisy Thompson in the room? Ah, uh, Daisy, this is your moment in the, in, well, the moment of stardom for you. So Daisy's going to ask the panel a question on policing. Yeah, so this is mainly directed to Royston, obviously. Um, I've been expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your manifesto states that you will bring 20,000 more police officers by 2022. Um, however, directly relating to Southampton, the, er uh, the amount of crime that we've seen in this area, particularly to this university and these parks that surround us, um, do you now regret your party's decision to cut 20,000 police officers in the last nine and a half years? Would you admit that that was a mistake? Um, not really, no. And I'll tell you why. Because in all those years, crime has been falling and violent crime has been falling. Uh, it's starting to change. That is starting to change now. And that is the reason the Prime Minister... Uh, made that commitment back in the summer that we would increase police numbers by 20,000. Now, people will say, because there's a political dimension to all these things, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a grown-up, it's not my first time, um, that you've cut too many police and now you're just going to replace them, so you were wrong to do so. That isn't necessarily the case. There, are, there is a time for more and there is a time when you can do without as much resource. Um, there is a big uptick with 
violent crime that's in, involving sharp objects and knives. And there is more than just a policing issue with that. And I, you know, I find this really, really difficult because people will assume that because I'm a conservative and I wear a suit, therefore I fit into a stereotypical box. And I mostly don't, as it happens. My, the reason I'm a conservative is because I agree with most of what conservatives say about the economy and growing our economy and getting people in the work and giving them opportunities and giving them a life they can be proud of. But I don't always agree with everything. And one of the things that I find really difficult, and this isn't conservative policy at all, but I find it really difficult, is some of the people that are making these comments about violent crime and the rest are, not in this room I'm sure, but are sometimes part of the problem. So when people want to go and smoke a bit of cannabis or whatever, that doesn't get here by legal routes. And when you hear about the county lines problem, which is causing a lot of the knife crime, there's an end user to that product. And those end users, whether they like it or not, are in some part, small or otherwise, responsible for some of these problems. So what I get sometimes when I'm knocking doors, and I don't know what people are doing behind their doors and I couldn't even guess, but there are people, and I don't know which ones they are, because like I say, I can't guess, who will tell me that there are not enough police on the streets and that knife crime is out of control, while at the same time are using recreational drugs that come down through a route that is illegal and that in some small part causes those problems. So yes, we need more police on the streets now. We need more because of reassurance for the public, and we definitely need more for resilience for the police themselves. When I went out with the police force, the thing they told me beyond everything else, everyone thinks that these arguments are always about our pay's not gone up enough or, or something of that nature. It isn't that. What they say to me is, we now have a number of police that if we have a really serious incident, and sometimes Hampshire will be asked to go into London if there's a threat of terrorism or something of that nature. But if there's a really serious incident, we're not sure we have the resilience behind us if it all goes horribly wrong. And that is the reason, over, over and above everything else, why police numbers are being increased. But like I say, there are some people who will talk one thing about resources and what we should do about crime, and actually are part of the end user problem. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Simon, then Osborne, I think, and then to Jack, if that's okay. But again, very briefly, if yeah, we I'll can. Try I'm sorry, I, I, I yeah. know I feel like I'm putting you under pressure. So the, the 20,000 uh, is a slogan, really. Basically, it's a slogan. It's, it appears on every piece of conservative literature, and effectively, we're going to solve the, the issues in society by recruiting 20,000 more police officers. Well, that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. You know, you've got rid of 20,000 experienced officers with, with countless years of, of quality and training and experience in the community with knowledge and, and networks that are useful in preventing crime, and then you're going to replace them with 20,000 brand new people who've got no training, no experience. And recruiting them is, is, is going to be next to impossible, possibly in the short term. You've also got to remember that, that policing and crime is, is changing, ever-changing and more complex. A lot of crime these days is fraud, it's online, and that requires a different set of skill sets. It doesn't require police to be walking the streets, it requires them to be walking the internet and looking for those uh, criminals in action. And so the, what you need is a, is a more nuanced approach to, to criminality. Uh, and, I mean, the, the issue around uh, soft drugs is an interesting one. I know that two of the parties present have got a clear policy, which I frankly tend to support, about looking at what is the effective policing of drugs in this country. Uh, do we need to decriminalise elements of, of certainly soft drugs and effectively take the criminal out of the marketplace? And I think that I, I would be probably supportive of that as an individual. I don't think it's in our manifesto. Okay. Thank you. Um, we in Versity, that is in our manifesto. Mm -hmm. We're looking at uh, decriminalising rec recreational drugs in order to essentially do away with the criminal element part of it. But uh, when it comes down to the policing aspects of it, there's not a day go by now when I, when I read the local paper and I'm finding out that you know there's been robberies, theft, crime of some description every day, loads of it in our area, bikes getting nicked from the park. Knife crime is an issue. Um, and the policing aspect does have a role to play in it. I think diminishing the police force has obviously has obvious impacts on that, but I think it ripples into a wider aspect of it as well. Um, you know, people are working so so damn hard at the moment to make ends meet, and they're having to hold down multiple jobs in order just to, just to support their families, that people aren't even necessarily getting the time to spend with their families to raise them with the right values so that they don't go out committing crime in those sort of ways. So these are kind of aspects. So many cuts have happened in the, in the local communities that things like youth clubs practically cease to exist at the moment. 
parents that want to take their kids to local clubs, all the, all the after school clubs are pretty much paid for clubs. You've got to fund those somehow, and there isn't anything out there to support those in the local communities. So the problems, yes, there is a problem with the policing aspect, but the problem is actually bigger, um, and it comes down to the community level as well. And those are aspects that our, our party is very keen to, to get involved in and, and look at those sort of things. Okay, thank you. Jack? Yeah, so um, we have very clear policy when it comes to uh, cannabis. We believe that it should be legal and regulated uh, because we want to take the criminal uh, effectively uh, out of the system. So we would invest uh, £1 billion into uh, hiring 2,000 new police officers because that's a realistic target to actually meet the need. 20,000 is just a slogan and is to make the Conservatives look tough on crime. And uh, it, it is. No, no it's not. <laughs> <laughs> we will disagree. No, we will disagree because uh, it's not a slogan. But it is. It's on every bit of literature. <laughs> so yeah, I know that's because we're telling people we're getting 20,000 police. That's how we, can that's we, how hold, we tell can them. We hold it? Can we hold you to that? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, well, that's how it works. Okay. So next time you can hold me to it. Well, if you don't mind me chirping in, local council level, but how many of those police are going to be in Southampton? Uh, of those police, we don't know because the first 200 that we're employing is going to be... 15 in Southampton. Out of the 20,000, it will be rationed. It will be rationed in the same way as the Police and Crime Commissioner from Hampshire decides to put it there. And it's our job, our job to make sure that we get as many of those as we can. But I don't know the number because it's 20,000 police. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Jack. Okay, continue. Back. Yes. Uh, get back to it. So we actually believe that um, a lot of the issues kind of there's too many uh, people who are caught up in kind of kind of what we would regard as kind of soft uh, uh, crimes. And we've reduced kind of non-custodial, uh, we've reduced, sorry, short-term prison sentences uh, for those kind of antisocial behaviour and those kind of those kind of soft crimes. And we believe actually that um, non-custodial sentences, curfews and uh, tagging and the like would be far more suitable uh, and would reduce the strain on our uh, overburdened prisons. So actually, uh, we believe, quite similar to the Green Party actually, uh, that we should be legalising uh, regulated cannabis and in uh, improving community policing. Uh, with regards to the uh, the police numbers, we believe that we could, uh, with those 2,000, that would be two more police. Is that a police. slogan? No, <laughs> uh, that's a realistic uh, ambition. So with those 2,000 more police officers, we'd uh, put two more, on average, uh, in every ward. Okay, thank you. And very briefly, Kim. No, 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 no go ahead, Kim. Oh, I'm not leaving you out. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but I have been trying okay. to go I fairly. You know, going back and forwards, yeah. But okay. Let me just... On policing, I mean, at the end of the day, it was, it's the EU um, criteria to cut down on, on our policing, on our, on our army, our forces. You know, we've got less forces now, less people in the forces than what we had in the days of, of Napoleon. That's the next it's, question, Ken, wait for that. Oh, OK, but, OK. <laughs> but getting back to policing, I mean, quite frankly, I think we should legalise all drugs, not just soft drugs. Legalise coke, legalise heroin. Le so it's controlled. So people actually go and we get administered and, and things are controlled because then you can cut out all the drug dealers. And as for the policing, this isn't about, I, I respect what Simon said, and Simon's got a point about online fraud. But this is, we're not talking about online fraud here. I'm talking about like my granddaughters going home from a nightclub and walking through the park and feeling safe. You know, you know the money from that should come from the nightclubs that should, that should contribute extra money. I think some of them actually do okay. to, towards local police in, in the council. You know, there's no reason why we shouldn't have more local police paid for by the council that are going to charge the nightclubs money towards the, the extra policemen to protect our, our people when they're walking home from clubs, because that's important. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to really have to raise song. What are the party's policies on defence and trident? And the second part of the question, um, can you explain why the Labour leadership refuses to apologise mm. to the Jewish community over its anti-Semitism? issues. So I'll start with yes, Simon, of course, yeah. well, because it's directed I mean, at... I can't speak for the Labour leadership, and I can only speak, of course, from my own personal experience, and I've never experienced uh, anti-Semitism in Southampton Labour Party. We had one member who uh, stepped over the line and was suspended, uh, unfortunately subsequently uh, passed away, and so we didn't reach the, uh, the point of a tribunal for him. Uh, but generally speaking, I've always believed that this city is, uh, is primarily uh, tolerant and multicultural and we've always respected others' views. And I know that is true across parties. And we've you know, celebrated that through a variety of different ways. The Council of Faiths here is very strong, and we work collaboratively together with all faiths to make that work. Uh, on the issue of Trident, the, the Labour policy is to uh, um, uh, 
similar to the conservative one is to maintain trade but the the actual uh, section in the manifesto says uh, that we wish to engage and use the leverage that we have through having nuclear weapons to try and work a process internationally so that nuclear weapons disappear from the planet and of course that is entirely in keeping with the Labour tradition of, uh, of Na Anirin Bevan, who said that, that if you have a, a, a way of making something positive happen to the world, you should use it rather than just giving up nuclear weapons and having no say in their future. So that is our okay, Thank you. So we just may as well go straight down on the road, with Sir Osman. Um, well, I'll talk about Trident. I think it's uh, you're pretty clear on the Green Party's views on that. Um, it's uh, We've got a simple perspective on it, which is we want to scrap it. That money could be used best elsewhere. I mean, I was 18 years old when Chernobyl went off, and uh, I, I was affected by that in many ways, and uh, that's probably led my decision, including what I do today. Um, so ironically as well, my birthday happens to fall 26 years after the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, so you know, as you do, you look up your birthday and see what happened in the world. You sort of look into things like that, and that also has a bit of an impact on me. I, I look at it really simply. If ever we have to use this nuclear deterrent, then it's kind of game over, isn't it? I mean, you know, the climate's gone, people are gone, mankind is over, it will turn into a tit-for-tat exercise, so frankly it just shouldn't exist. I would much rather see us using that money for something more beneficial to, to people than doing away with any form of nuclear weaponry and technology for that matter in the fullness of time altogether, plain and simple. The anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Um, well, frankly, oh, sorry, uh, alleged. Well, <laughs> anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Yeah, it's, it's as much as to respect the Islamophobia conversations that people are having about the Conservative Party as well. I'm a, I'm a Muslim, so, um, so, yeah, so I don't, you know, I, I think plain and simply there's no room in our society for any form of racism, full stop, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Royston? Um, I, as far as I'm aware, Jeremy Corbyn has apologised in round figures for what's happened within the Labour Party. Keir Starmer did it yesterday instead of John McDonnell. Mm. Uh, if you're talking about whether there's an anti Semitic issue in the Labour Party, I would much rather leave that to Simon to answer, but the question of whether he should apologise or not is what you apologise for. So first you have to establish is, 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 is Jeremy Corbyn an anti-Semite, and if he is, is he apologising for that, or is he apologising for what's happened within the Labour Party that hasn't been nipped in the bud? So I think he probably already has done that. On the question of Trident, uh, yeah, in an ideal world we wouldn't need any of these things, we wouldn't need anything. However, we're not in an ideal world, we're in a very dangerous world, and we're in a world where people like President Putin from Russia will invade a country with impunity and you don't know where that's going to stop, we don't know where that's going to stop and if we want to make sure that the first uh, job of government is to defend the people so that we can have these conversations and fix the other issues that surround us, then we need to defend our country and if we have a deterrent and that would appear to have worked for some considerable time, then my view is we should keep that. Okay, thank you, Wilson. Jack? Yeah, uh, firstly on the issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, uh, it's, not, I, it's not really a question of whether individual uh, people in the, the Labour leadership are anti-Semitic or, you know, that, that's a question they would have to answer. Um, it's more that is the, is the Labour Party institutionally anti-Semitic in that it does not seem to reach the outcomes uh, for Jewish members that it should do. And I believe that's, at the moment, it looks to be the case where you're finding that uh, a lot of uh, Jewish members at Luciana Berger, Jewish MP, uh, felt forced out of the Labour Party simply because members who had been uh, anti-Semitic or had engaged in anti-Semitic tropes were finding that they actually weren't having uh, any sort of disciplinary action or any sort of meaningful disciplinary action taken against them. So I think that is a, a serious uh, issue in the Labour Party and they do uh, need to sort that. With regards to Trident, it's always a difficult uh, question to answer because I think if you ever get to the point where nuclear weapons become an option, then you've kind of failed anyway yeah, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, any Prime Minister who ever thinks about pressing the button uh, shouldn't be in the position. But it's that case where if the other side have them, then you kind of have to have them too. And it's, it's horrible. It's the, the British situation for the last few hundred years in terms of foreign policy has been effectively maintain the balance of power in Europe and the rest of the world. And you can't do that if you take away what is a significant deterrent from one side and it becomes uh, disjointed. It, it, it's horrible because I'd never uh, countenance them ever being used by Britain or anybody else, but we don't live in that secure society where we can afford the luxury of just getting rid of uh, our nuclear deterrent. Okay. Okay. 
Kim? Um, on the Trident thing, I absolutely agree. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to be in a position of strength. And we can only have an opinion in the world from a position of strength. If we get rid of our Trident, we've got nothing to defend ourselves. Well, prevention's better than a cure. As long as we've got it, we, I think we won't be attacked because they know we can fight back. But if you get rid of it, and then we capitulate, then we're in trouble. You know, we're just like, a, we're there to be taken at any time. So no, we definitely can't get rid of Trident, in my opinion. As for the um, anti-Jewish um, thing in the Labour Party, I think it's been in their institution for about 20, 30 years. It's, it, there's an under, underlying current there, uh, which needs to be sorted out. I don't know why it is there. And I mean, I'm, I'm half Jewish and I'm UK, so I haven't got a chance. But um, with Labour, they really need to get uh, at, in, on, on top of this and actually get rid of it all completely. You know, there's about three or four million um, I forget how many Jews in, in this country. Three or four hundred thousand, or is it three hundred thousand? Mm, yeah. yeah, three or four hundred thousand. You know, and and there's probably about f three to four million Muslims. So, is it the fact that that Labour look at it to try to to curse the Muslim vote? You know, I know it's a bad thing to say, but I'm just speaking the truth. It could be. You know, it's it's um. But having said that, we're all people. You know, black, white. Muslim Christians, we're British, we're here, and we're all, we're just, you know, what I want to achieve with UKIP is a party where we had that feeling of being proud to be British back in 2012 in the Olympics when we're watching Mo Farah going around the corner, we're going towards that winning line, and we're all screaming from the win with our hearts bursting with pride because we're British. That's the, that's the feeling I feel. So, you know, with parties, I mean, the Tories have been accused of anti anti um, Islam stuff that's going on at the moment. But I'm sure it's just one or two bigots and then the press love to glorify it all anyway. You know, point these one or two people out and get rid of them. From the Labour Party, from the Tory Party, from UKIP, anywhere. There's no room in this world for racism. Let's get rid of it completely. Thank you. Do you know what? There's only about 30 seconds to go, but with the Brexit and the Remain and the Brexit, you know, let's... Whatever we do, you know, we've got Christmas coming up, and I wish you all Merry Christmas and all have a top Christmas. And to go home with your families and your mum and dads, or especially your granddads, might be a, a, a Brexiteer, and no doubt a lot of younger people will remain. But, you know, put that to one side. You know, the fact is, life goes on whether we remain or whether we have Brexit, and all this politics nonsense, you know, quite frankly, you know, it's about people, it's about families, and that, enjoy your Christmases and, and have a very happy new year. And I'm sure that next year, in the new year, in that, do you know what? We'll strive forward and whatever happens, whatever life throws at us, and that if we stick together, we'll be fine. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Kim. Jack? Very clearly, uh, on the 12th of December, please do vote Liberal Democrat. Um, stop Brexit, effectively uh, tackle the climate emergency and invest in our public services. Uh, together, if we... Uh, stand uh, united, we can create a brighter future for our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Royston? Uh, vote Conservative on the 12th of December. First and foremost, to get Brexit done. If not your thing, I understand that, but a question of honesty is more important than everything else we'll talk about in politics, or you can't believe a single word I say, uh, or we say. Strong economy, more people in jobs, more money for our uh, public services, and actually valuing everyone equally. Thank you very much. Osman? Um, I would say please vote Green um, and think beyond Brexit, think about the climate emergency. You don't want to be derailed by everything else that's going on. There's a bigger picture to think about. So, Thank you, Osman. Simon? This is a very marginal seat. There's realistically only two people on this panel that can win this election. Um, it's it's still the real Simon at the moment. Yes, <laughs> I, know, I appreciate it's that. It's <laughs> last, <laughs> time, <laughs> last time round we managed to, to get together about 94% of the votes in the constituency and there was 31 between us. Uh, Labour's programme for government is a programme of investment, particularly in young people, investment in their future in terms of improving housing, educational opportunities and of course our brilliant National Health Service. Thank you very much. Thank you.